So yeah, uh, now I am going to be talking about um, metagenome assemble, genome assembly and binning. Um, so in this lecture and the workshop, um, I hope that you'll be, um, I'll be teaching you to understand how metagenomic sequence data is assembled into contigs and then binned into mags. Um, I'll be explaining some of the metrics that were used to assess the quality of mags, um, giving an overview of genome resolved metagenomics using the AMVO ecosystem, um, and also how mag-based analyses differ from read-based analyses. So before I get going, I just wanted to give some definitions of things. Um, so these are kind of the key concepts in um, making mags. So what we've been talking about so far is read-based analyses, where we have our raw metagenomic reads, and that, uh, that's directly what we're using for the taxonomic annotation. Um, now we'll be looking at assembling those reads uh, into longer sequences based on overlaps between the reads. Um, essentially, we want to overlap all of the reads that we have enough that we generate the longest sequences that we can. Um, and this can be either on a sample by sample basis, or we might want to do co-assembly, um, where you're assembling the reads from multiple samples all at once. Um, and that can be beneficial if you didn't have as much read depth in single samples, but you know that you have multiple samples that should be similar, um, you might stand more chance of being able to join together those reads than you would from an individual sample, but you wouldn't want to do something like that on samples from drastic, drastically different environments or something like that, because you're not expecting overlap between what's present. Um, so after assembling, we have contigs, um, and this is essentially the longer reads that I just talked about us generating. Um, so they're kind of decide, um, defined as a set of DNA segments or sequences that overlap in a way that provides a contiguous representation of a genomic region. Um, and then scaffolds, um, which we actually don't talk about too much in um, the workshop or quite as much as um, in some other areas probably, but they are essentially a set of contigs with potentially gaps in between them. And there are different ways that you can try and work out that you might think that there is a gap in between some of your contigs um, when you're thinking about it as a whole genome. Um, so once we have contigs, we typically are binning them. Um, and so this can be done in a variety of different ways, which I'll go through later on. Um, but essentially, this is the process of associating DNA fragments from a metagenome assembly together based on shared characteristics um, to generate mags. And so the mags are then kind of our final product, the metagenome assembled genomes. And typically after the binning, we will have to do some kind of manual refinement of what um, computationally we might have been together um, doesn't always make sense um, when we kind of eyeball it. Anyone have questions on that so far? Okay, feel free to jump in with questions at any point. Um, so to give a brief overview of how this is different from read-based approaches, um, essentially when we have read-based approaches, we are comparing those raw reads to reference genomes, whether that's for taxonomic annotation or functional annotation, we're comparing them to databases of things that we already know about. Um, typically with the assembly based approaches, um, we are assembling things into contigs and then we are using those kind of de novo contigs um, for predicting which genes um, or taxa that they might belong to. Um, so in terms of why we want to assemble mags, um, I'm sure many of you are aware, but much of microbial diversity hasn't been or cannot currently be cultured, um, whether that's kind of a real, it actually can't ever be done, or just not with current methods um, is a different question, I guess. Um, but then just to give an overview, in um, the latest version of NCBI RefSeq, uh, there were 151,000 gene organisms almost, um, including about 82,500 bacteria. Um, so this is massively different than the number of these that can actually be cultured. 
Um, and when we have mags, this kind of helps because before we're just looking at a bunch of reads, but now we can start to understand the genomic context and potential. Um, you know, if there's a particular gene that we're interested in, then we can start to work out which other genes might be surrounding it. Um, and obviously that's kind of useful in many different applications. Um, we can also use this to understand how strains evolve over time. We can look at changes between the genomes that we have, you know, at one time point versus the next time point. Um, we can assemble genomes for taxa that we may be unable to isolate. Um, and where the short reads are very reliant on reference databases, which can often be pretty limited to just what's been characterized, um, assembling mags allows us to kind of look at we can see that this is just a genome and it doesn't have to be similar to a genome that we have before. Um, so therefore we can use it for kind of not uh, classifying novel taxa or something like that, identifying novel genes and proteins um, and helping us to understand a bit more of how microbes adapt um, to changes in their environments. And so I wanted to kind of start by giving um, a fairly high level overview of just what I thought was quite a cool um, study from a preprint that came out recently um, of just a nice use of mags. Um, so in this study, they sampled a single lake um, over about 20 years, um, and they sampled it across a lot of different seasons. Um, and so from this, they had kind of metagenome samples from each of these time points or almost each of these time points. Um, and they're able to assemble mags from all of those and then look at how those genomes evolve over time. Um, and so this gave them a whole load of other information, uh, but also they were able to look at things like um, whether the strains had diversity over that fluctuated with seasons. Um, so that was kind of what they found here, that sometimes uh, you would see uh, a peak in diversity within a species um, that might come before a peak in the abundance of that species. Um, and yeah, as I say, I'm not trying to go through this in detail, um, but essentially they were able to kind of infer a lot of useful biological things from having these mags that you wouldn't really be able to get from the reference-based read approaches. Um, because you just wouldn't be able to see the kind of strain diversity or, you know, the genes associated with those and seeing that they're losing or gaining genes over time. Um, yeah, so I thought that was a kind of cool application of these, although it did come from a massive sequencing effort. Um, and then on the other side, we have when assembly might not work very well. Um, when we might not be able to get very good mags. Um, so the success uh, really depends on abundance and genome size of your taxon of interest. If you have something that's of really, really low abundance in your metagenome samples, it's going to be really difficult to get enough reads to assemble them into a genome. Um, and with that also comes if you have a really big genome, um, it's also going to be difficult to get enough coverage of those reads to be able to assemble them, assemble them together. Um, so assembly tends to work pretty well for bacterial genomes, which are typically fairly small um, and well studied, um, but it doesn't tend to work quite so well for eukaryotes because they have really large genomes. And so you're going to need to be sequencing in a lot more depth to have enough reads just to assemble them. Um, it can also be a bit complicated for viruses um, and that I'm definitely not someone that knows much about viruses, um, but they work a little bit differently than bacteria. So when we're thinking of sequencing an assembly of a single genome, um, as I said, we're trying to go from our reads um, to a full genome um, for a particular organism. Um, and in a little more detail, we're trying to go from, you know, these reads into our contigs, into scaffolds, which potentially, you know, have gaps between them. And while ideally we would like to have a full closed genome, often we're going to end up with some gaps. Um, and so, oh yeah, just to explain the scaffold slightly more, um, when we have sequenced reads that we're turning into contigs, some of the way that we're able to infer the gaps um, and how we know that we might have a gap um, between the contigs is if we have a read of um, the same pair that, has, that doesn't join together, um, but because it was sequenced in a, as a paired end read, we know that they should have been fairly close together in the genome. 
Um, and when we're looking at sequencing and assembly of single genomes, um, I've just taken some numbers from the IMR website just to give a rough overview, but obviously they are, there are many different places that you can get things sequenced. Um, if you're thinking of a prokaryotic genome, typically if you have DNA just from that isolate, um, you might be looking at about $500 for sequencing of that, and that will give you about 100 times coverage on a typical kind of five megabyte genome. Um, then you also have the other option that you have long reads, um, and I will go a little more into the differences between short and long reads. Um, but essentially with long reads, you can get um, de novo assembly to work a little more because you're more likely to have overlap between them when you have a much longer read to start with. Um, so you can get about 400 times coverage for about $300 there. Um, and this kind of touches on the difference between de novo and reference based that you can, if you have a taxa that is of particular interest, you may well already have the genome sequenced um, and you may be looking to resequence it to see if there have been any changes in that genome over time. Um, and you can map the reads onto the existing genome, um, which doesn't require as much sequencing depth as the de novo assembly. Um, but the coverage that need, is needed really depends on the application that you have. Um, and then I just really briefly wanted to mention pan genomes. Um, that includes kind of all of the genomic information from multiple strains of similar species. I think that's a reasonable-ish definition of that. Um, but essentially, often people may be looking to sequence um, multiples of similar strains so that they can be sure that they're capturing all of the diversity within that species. Um, so going from having our single organism to um, sequencing and assembly of metagenomes, we now obviously have reads in a sample that belong to many different species. Um, and we're hoping that we will be able to assemble these in a similar way um, into hopefully genomes that all of the reads that you've assembled and the context that you've assembled into that genome came from the same species. Um, but of course, because you have not got unlimited sequencing depth, some species are going to have better coverage of their genomes than others. And for a similar-ish overview of um, the kinds of costs that you're looking at then for having enough depth for metagenome assembly, um, you can see here that really you're starting from the lowest cost of about $220 a sample, which is um, I think what I mentioned already in the beginner workshop for kind of a general metagenome sequencing. Um, but if you're looking at getting much more depth within your sample, um, then you're actually getting pretty expensive up here for the metagenome assembly, uh, $3,600 uh, with the short reads um, or $3,000 to $5,000 with the long reads. Um, so obviously this is much, much more than a single organism. Um, and that's one of the reasons that people will often do the co-assembly of similar samples so that you're able to get enough sequencing depth that you're actually able to kind of put together meaningful information about the samples. So to just touch slightly on short read versus long read versus hybrid approaches. Um, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I think honestly, a lot of the time, like more depth is going to be better, but obviously there's going to be some trade off with cost. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> I mean, do you want to add anything to that, Morgan? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, essentially we have short read, long read, you can sequence more or less in any of these, and then you have hybrid approaches. And essentially hybrid approaches are to get around the issues 
that you have with longer reads typically having lower accuracy than the short reads. Um, so I think I had mentioned that um, in some of the initial, well, I mentioned in the beginner workshop, but in some of the initial kind of long read approaches, you're actually getting like 80 to 90% accuracy versus short read of like maybe 99.7, 99.9% accuracy. And so often you may be using your long reads to assemble together. And that's great because you're likely to get overlaps and you're likely to be able to assemble a pretty good genome if you have the depth. Um, and then you can kind of correct these error prone long reads with your short reads, which tend to have higher accuracy by kind of mapping them onto those longer reads. Do you need to correct your long reads if you use a high-fi? No, so I mean, high-fi is a little bit different because that is already sequencing it loads of times so it can cancel out those errors or correct for the errors that it had. Yeah, I mean, does, Morgan, maybe you can answer that. Does PacBio Hi-Fi work, like, is that what we're using for the long reads for something like metagenome assembly now? Yes, with the Hi-Fi readings, you know, hybrid was really popular for a while. Um, and our most recent stuff, also kind of as well, just advice, um, shows that really the Hi-Fi readings can only get actually that much more benefit with the amount of processing. Uh, and so, For a while, we were on to really just the switch combo of short and long to sort of maximize cost, but uh, that was for high five reads. Now, for maybe a bit of the story, and I, I don't know that one as well, and the hybrid still makes the reads there. I mean, you may have used it to increase your quality scores. Yeah, but how long does it take? Because I found it very effective to get number four, which is like a big, like, uh, high five, but yeah, like hybrid used to be the, the perfect one, but now actually it's going to be a better assembly with just putting your money to high five. Yeah, that's what Uh, okay, so then assuming that we've been able to assemble some genomes, um, and I will go through the bioinformatics steps involved in a minute, um, there are a number of metrics that we use for assessing um, our quality or kind of the performance of our assembling. Um, and so these, just to go through kind of briefly, we have assembly length. Um, and so this is just the total number of nucleotides that we have been able to assemble into a genome. This doesn't mean we have no gaps between those contigs. This is just the total number of the length of um, nucleotides that altogether we're saying we think belong to the same genome. Uh, you can have assembly contiguity. Um, and so the N50 metric that we have is, um, you'll often see it and you might see N with a different number as well. Um, this is kind of defined as the length of the shortest contig for which longer and equal length contigs cover at least 50% of the assembly. I always find that a bit difficult to get my head around, but um, essentially it's saying that, um, you know, a lot of your assembly is covered by really long contigs and that's great. Um, assembly coverage. Um, so you can look at the percentage of your short read sequences that map to the assembly that you have made. Um, you can look at the number of metagenomes you have. And often people will use some kind of uh, metric like looking at to have above 70% completeness and 10% redundancy. And I will explain completeness and redundancy in a second. Um, you can have mag contiguity, so the number of contigs per mag. And then completeness um, and contamination are often assessed using a tool called CheckM. And this essentially um, has a database of single copy genes. So it's genes that you're expecting to only have one copy of in a genome. Um, of course, this can vary slightly, but I think there's about, it varies depending on the database. There are different databases available. Uh, it's typically around 80 or 100 genes that you're expecting to be present in a single copy. And so the completeness is the percentage of those single copy genes that you are finding in your genome that you've assembled. And the contamination is the number of those thing is the percentage of those single copy genes that are present in multiple copy copies, essentially. Does that make sense to everyone? <laughs> 
Um, so then when we move into the kind of workflow that we're using to generate mags, Typically, we're going from our raw reads, we're assembling the reads into contigs, and um, we then typically might be identifying genes within the contigs. And this doesn't mean that we are identifying uh, the function of the genes. This means that we're just saying we think this section of DNA is a gene um, based on like start and stop codons. Um, you then generate coverage or composition profiles. So you're typically mapping back to the raw reads in your sample to work out the abundance of these contigs in each of your individual samples. Um, and then you can use those sample profiles um, or something else, which I'll talk about in a minute, to cluster the contigs into bins. You can also use things like the GC composition um, to do that. Um, you're typically then refining your bins uh, working out whether what was been together computationally really makes sense when you're looking at the data. Um, at this point, you kind of have mags, and then you typically are looking to do some kind of taxonomic and functional annotation to those mags, and then you have them for any downstream analyses that you might be interested in. And what we are using and what many people use now is uh, called Anvio. Um, this is almost like an equivalent to Chime for metagenomics. Um, so this is kind of an integrated workflow. It has a lot of programs that work together that are generated by different people that are kind of combined together um, into this one kind of workflow. They have a bunch of different tutorials that you can follow. Um, it is slightly overwhelming, all of the options that are on there, but it's, they do have everything quite well documented on there. Um, it's relatively easy to use and it is what we will be using. Um, and so then for several of these, when I'm talking about the tools that we're using for each step, um, I'm giving an example of kind of how these tools perform. And these tools were assessed using um, a study called the Critical Assessment of Metagenome Interpretation. So this was what Morgan mentioned earlier and forgot what the I stood for. <laughs> um, Basically, this is CAMI 2. There was a CAMI 1 that talked about um, mainly taxonomy, and then CAMI 2 was really looking at metagenomes. Um, it's a really complicated study design. Um, I've read this paper many times now, and I still struggle to work out exactly how they did things. Um, but essentially, they took a lot of genomes that were newly sequenced from isolates, and they assembled them with spades, they removed smaller contigs, um, and they then removed their assemblies that um, had a large amount of contamination or a low completion and classified the genomes taxonomically. And they then kind of used these genomes to make test data sets. Um, they had a few different test data sets, um, and I just wanted to give a little example of how they use that. So they essentially take those mags and they have generated either short or long reads kind of fake short or long reads from them i think um and they're taking the isolate genomes that came from a particular environment and kind of putting them back together into random samples so that they can make mock samples that they know the taxonomy of and what it should be as well as the what the genome should be um they also have some interesting setups, including whether these have a related strain present in databases or not. Um, and they added in some different circular elements, including plasmids and viruses, to kind of see how all of the different methods would deal with that. Um, and then essentially they made this data available for the creators of all of the different tools that are used for many of these steps and said like, all right, give us your assembly based on these. Um, so they have different challenges for assembly, binning, genome binning, taxonomic, they call it binning, but that's essentially taxonomic profiling, um, as well as kind of other profiling. So does that make enough sense? Okay. Um, so then uh, I mainly wanted to give this as a kind of an example of the different tools that are used for these different steps. Uh, these graphs are kind of difficult to look at, but basically these are different tools that are used for assembly. There's GSA, SPADES, GATB, MegaHit is the one that we're going to be using, and there are other ones. And then they've looked at different metrics. Um, so we've got the genome fraction, so the percent of the genome that these um, tools were managed manage to kind of assemble into context. Um, the number of mismatches, so the number of mistakes that they were making, um, 
as well as misassemblies, kind of other mistakes. The N50, as I said, the ability for them to kind of recall the different strains that were present, um, as well as the precision on the strains that were present. Um, and so these perform really differently. Um, if these lines are around the outer circle, that means that tool was performing well. Um, and these are the different colors are their different data sets. So you can see that some of the tools seem to fairly consistently perform well, like mega hit always seems to be doing pretty well, or most of the time, at least in comparison with the other ones, but this varies. Um, does that make sense? All right. This took me so long to grasp myself that I feel like I need to keep checking. Um, but, okay, so then they also have a look at um, how the sequencing, oh, sorry, how the sequencing depth essentially impacts the fraction of genome that they were able to recover. Um, and it seems that some assemblers require a lot more sequencing coverage than other assemblers do to do a similar job. Um, so at this point, if we have assembled contigs, we are then able to do some analyses on contigs. So sometimes people are only really interested in assembling their reads into contigs and they don't try and do anything further with mags. Um, and that's essentially because not all of our contigs are going to end up being binned into mags um, and we might not have the read depth available for that. Um, but with contigs, we're a lot more likely to have complete genes or functions than we are when we're looking at just the reads. Um, and we should be able to look at like the flanking regions of um, those genes as well. And particularly in things like AMR, people are often really interested in that kind of thing. Um, and so within the contigs, also like whether you're continuing with just contigs or whether you're bidding into MEGs, you can identify the genes. Um, typically, we're using something like Prodigal, which identifies those genes. That's a tool. Um, we can identify the single copy core genes in them, um, those genes that are used for assessing the completeness and contamination uh, with something like CheckM. We can classify the taxonomy and we can generate the abundance or coverage profiles of the contigs in our samples. And so at that point, we then look at clustering or binning our contigs. Um, and so this can, we can use a few different things for it. Um, we can use nucleotide comp composition. So the GC percent is what's usually used for that. Um, we can look at the phylogenetic affiliation of the genes. Um, we can look at read depth or coverage within the contigs. Um, and we can look at the coverage patterns within our samples as well. And that's essentially because we're expecting that contigs that came from the same genome initially should be present in reasonably similar abundances across different samples. We're expecting their nucleotide composition to be, obviously it varies across the genome, but we're expecting it to be maybe more similar than it would be for unrelated organisms. And again, you're expecting that if you're able to tax it, um, classify the taxonomy of your genes, um, that they should be similar uh, within different contigs that came from the same organism. So again, there are a number of different tools that are used for bidding contigs. Um, and here, this was just a few different metrics on one of the data sets that was used in Kemi. Um, they had these five different binners that they use and they look at the completeness um, on average that these um, binners were able to get. You'll see that this is on average pretty low. Um, their purity is essentially redundancy flipped that makes sense, 100 minus redundancy. Um, and so high is good instead of low being good. Um, they also have some other um, charts showing the average read identity um, to the reference genomes, uh, the percentage of the base pairs that were able to be binned, um, as well as the percentage of genomes from what was in the original sample that were able to be binned. Um, and so I think you see here that these don't necessarily vary as much as the different assembly methods did. Um, but there is some variation here. Um, and there are also other tools that actually will take the output of multiple binners. Um, there's one called DAS tool. It will take the output of multiple binners um, and give you kind of um, the whatever was similar between them, essentially. Um, at this point, we will be looking at refining our bins. Um, so these are a couple of the bins that we're actually going to generate in the workshop. This is the output um, from Anvio. It's a kind of interactive um, 
interface that allows us to look at the bins. And so I wanted to use this to just demonstrate that if we look at this um, bin on the left, um, or essentially it's a mag maybe, uh, you can see that um, when you're looking at these different samples, so this is in the circles around the edge, it's showing the, you the abundance of all of the different sample um, contigs in each sample. And you can see that in this one, it's pretty much only found in this one sample. There's a few contigs that were in some other samples, but it's more or less only present in this one sample. Um, and they're not drastically different in abundance between the different contigs on the whole. Maybe this section seems to be a little bit different from the rest, this branch but essentially they're all relatively similar. Whereas if you look at this one on the right, you can see that now all of these contigs, so they're all of the branches on the tree, um, a lot of them are present in a lot of different samples, but the abundance is really kind of all over the place. Um, and you know, you've got some of the contigs that are just present in this one sample. These that really, it seems to vary, they're just not very present in many of them. All of these ones seem to be present in many of the samples, but perhaps at very varying abundances. Um, so you can see how, you know, you've got quite a clean bin here on the left, but on the right, it's a lot more complicated to look at. And when we check the quality of these different bins, sure enough, this one on the left, we find that this is 100% complete. So it has all of those single copy genes that we're expecting, and it's 0% redundant. So none of them are present in multiple copies. Whereas if we look at this one on the right, we have only got just under 60% completeness um, and almost 55% redundancy. So this is really high. If we were thinking of you know, wanting to take only genomes that maybe had above 50% completeness and below five or 10% redundancy, then we're gonna to need to do some more refinement of this um, in order to have something that's kind of a working genome. Um, and this is one of the ones that you will be working on in the workshop, um, but hopefully you can see how you might go about selecting um, different areas of this tree that you think don't belong to that same mag. That makes sense, everyone? Okay. Um, and so this is just an example of in AMVO, which we will be running. Um, these are some of the single copy core genes that it has. And so it has different groups of genes for different groups of organisms. Um, you'll see that it kind of calls them, so RKA 76, that's because there are 76 different genes. Um, and essentially, as this is running, you'll get some kind of an output like this that will say, you know, there were 76 of these that had 37 hits within your context. Um, for bacteria, there are 71 different ones, um, and there were 70 hits of these. Um, and so these uh, hidden Markov models are essentially multiple um, versions of these single copy genes from different organisms that they are combining together into one model so that you can search for this within your sequences. Um, so then at this point, hopefully if we have a refined bin um, that's then kind of once it's refined, it tends to be referred to as a mag. Um, then we're able to do things like assigning taxonomy to the mags. Um, so we can look at the single copy core gene taxonomy, and that's what something like CheckM, which we'll be running in the lab portion of this, does. Um, there are other kind of more sophisticated methods for um, classifying the taxonomy. So you can place them in a phylogenetic tree, for example, um, using GTDB toolkit. And so genome taxonomy database, it's kind of a new-ish database. Um, that looks at taxonomically classifying organisms based on their kind of phylogenetic affiliation rather than kind of classic taxonomy. Um, and usually you're using multiple genes for this alignment. Um, and I do have slightly more detail on this in the next slide. Um, you can also use the same kind of read-based methods um, that you use for assigning the taxonomy to the mags. I've seen Kraken, Metaflan, MOTUs be used. In mags, and often you might be running this on the context within mags and looking um, kind of for consensus uh, within those. Um, and there are other options that assign taxonomy to the context based on all of the possible protein fragments within those as well. Um, for example, MMC has been used to do this. And so I just have a little more detail on GTDB toolkit because that's, I guess, my preferred method. Unfortunately, it uses quite a lot of memory to do, so we can't actually do it in this workshop. 
Um, but essentially, this looks at identifying the genes within the mags. It then kind of pulls them out of your mags and uses them for alignment against their reference database. Um, and once it's aligned them um, using those multiple marker genes, it will then place the genomes into its reference tree and deter therefore determine the most likely classification for those mags. We can also annotate functions within our mags, um, and that's often what people are interested in doing. Um, so we can do this generally um, by running them against a very general database, for example, UniRef. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on that because there is a functional module tomorrow. Um, and there are specific functional databases that we can use as well based on our functions of interest. And some of the most um, frequently used ones are those for probably AMR genes, so antimicrobial resistance genes or um, ARGs. And the database that's most widely used for this um, is the CARD database, so the Comprehensive Antibiotic Resistance Database. Then this is their tool called the Resistance Gene Identifier. Um, so we will be running that later on in this lab. Um, and then we also have things like carbohydrate active enzymes. People often um, are interested in the function of those within their mags. Um, and there are other options. Um, for example, this tool called Pathofact is one that I've used. Um, and it's a pipeline for, ident for predicting virulence factors as well as antimicrobial resistance genes in metagenomic data. So people might choose to use an kind of integrated pipeline like this if you're not only interested in whether something has antimicrobial resistance genes, but also whether they might actually be likely to be pathogenic or not. Um, and so for pathofacts, um, and this is, I'm just kind of using it as an example of something that runs kind of multiple things all together within its own tool. Um, it does quite a few different things. So it's looking for virulence factors and signal peptides and toxin genes, as well as AMR genes, plasmids and phages. And it's looking to identify whether your AMR genes are present as kind of part of the core genome or whether they're part of um, some kind of mobile genetic element. Um, and for all of these, there are kind of differences in um, the confidence levels that they have in their prediction based on how they're predicted and um, their kind of identity to their references. For the mobile genetic elements, um, there are other tools that can predict these as well. People are often quite interested in identifying something like plasmids within their data. Um, and this is from a tool called Island Viewer which Morgan actually developed the first version of it. Um, it's now on its fourth, or it was on its fourth version as of 2017. Um, and essentially this, if this is your full genome, it looks to be identifying regions that possibly are genomic islands or something like a mobile genetic element. Um, and these are kind of defined as clusters of genes that have probable horizontal origin. Um, and so these colors then refer to just the prediction method that it's used for those. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of finish with an example of how we often use um, the output of different things like this. Um, so these were from a paper that um, I was part of last year. These were kind of the full number of mags that we got. Um, you obviously can't see very much in this figure, so I've just kind of cropped out most of it um, and kept some bits of it here. Um, but basically what we were able to do is we have all of these different mags, and these were all of the ones that we found were above 50% completion, below 10% redundancy. We classified all of them taxonomically. Um, you can see in many cases, we don't have particularly good classifications for them. Um, they're representing potentially novel taxa. They were found in the environment just downstream for a wastewater treatment plant. And so what we were interested in um, was looking at both their abundance in different biofilms, um, and then also whether they um, had virulence factors and toxins present, as well as well, whether they had AMR genes in various um, that give resistance to various different drug classes. Um, and so I really just wanted to kind of show the utility of mags and the sorts of things that we might be doing downstream of actually kind of generating them. Uh, we can also do um, other things like looking at the functions within those mags. Um, so this is just a really quick overview of a tool called POMS that Gavin, who was a previous PhD student in our lab, 
worked on. Um, so POMS stands for Phylogenetic Organization of Metagenomic Signals. Um, and this is a tool that when you have mags that are annotated with functions, you can look at whether those functions are enriched in certain branches of the tree that the mags come from. Um, and so you can just see whether, you know, you might have something that's kind of consistently uh, abundant in organisms that are in a particular branch of a tree versus something that might, um, you know, it might be more abundant in some mags than others, but there's really no phylogenetic organization of that. Um, so then I just want to finish with uh, the same slides that I showed yesterday for anyone. Um, I just wanted to, oh no, the day before, I guess. I just wanted to briefly talk about reproducibility in research. Um, so as you keep a lab book um, for keeping track of what you do in a lab, but, um, in a wet lab, it's important to do something similar for everything that we do with bioinformatic analyses. Um, we often want to keep track of the code that we write and run, whether that's because we might need to go back and modify it in the future, or whether we want to um, be able to modify it for a different project that we might be using. Um, so there are a few common methods that people use for this. Um, GitHub is really more version control than kind of useful as a notebook. Um, it requires you to kind of commit your changes after each um, iteration of code that you've done. So people might, if they're using this, and often it's used more collaboratively, they might be committing their code at the end of the day. And then if you realize that actually that day you broke something that you needed to be doing the next day, then you can go back to the previous version of your code. So you can use it that way and you can add comments within code. Um, but what we often like to use is something like R notebooks or Jupyter notebooks. Um, and these allow you to have kind of different code uh, chunks of code within them, and then you can comment things around them. Um, and I personally use R notebooks, um, and I wanted to give just a quick uh, demonstration of what they look like. So this is just taken from the website. Um, but essentially, you have these different chunks of code. And so this is an R chunk because you can see the R here. Um, but you can also have things like Python chunks of code within this or bash. Um, so you can use it for running all of your analyses from it, or you can just use it for kind of copying and pasting into somewhere else. Um, and it was it's useful to use something like this over something like Word because Word likes to reformat your punctuation and things like that. And then it breaks when you try and paste it back into your terminal and run it. Um, so it's kind of personal preference, what you might like to use. As I said, I personally like our notebooks. And it also means that you can kind of read things between R and Python within the same document without having to save them to a file first. Um, so for all of the remaining workshops and this morning's actually, there are our notebooks associated with them. So if you do want to work from that instead of copying and pasting things in, um, then please feel free to do so. They're linked from the web page.